off screen, it cuts and it goes somewhere else. How might you need that information as a camera person? Yeah, so you can figure out from this where, what image you want your final shot to be, where your camera needs to wind up. And what might you be able to glean from that as an actor? Yeah, legitimately you're not wrong. It tells you what to do. Um, because if you have the camera and you know you need to be at a certain point before that cut, right, as the cinematographer, then you know where you need to be in relation to the camera at that point. Um, and all that information is conveyed in this one line down here that says cut to, that lets you know when the scene ends. Um, you also have up here, this section. What is the function of this section right under setting and time? Yeah, it's the description. Um, you, you will not in screenwriting typically say, like, okay, we want you to do a close up on somebody's eye and then pan to somebody else's lips and then tilt the camera up to the new person's eye. People won't do that in screenwriting because what is that telling your reader? If I say, do a close up and then a pan, and then a tilt. What am I telling my reader of my script? Yeah, you're telling your reader where the camera is looking. But are you telling your reader what the camera is looking at? Not really. What the description is meant to do is what you guys are currently doing in the brain. It's telling your audience like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. Um, Mr. McLeese is sitting on a desk. We're all sitting in other desks. The room is loud because of star lunch. The cube is glass. You know, the lighting is harsh and fluorescent, like a typical school slash prison. Um, so you have all of these things going on. That is relevant information for everybody involved. What would that help you understand if you're acting in this role, if I give you that description of the space? Yeah, how, the, how anybody existing in that space might be feeling, what they might be thinking, what your character might be feeling or thinking. And then how does that impact you as the camera person to know that information? It's to know exactly what I need to know. Yeah, it gives you a context of like what's going on in the scene and gives you the liberty to then say, okay, they've described this scene really vividly to me. I think it's really important that I capture all of it. I think it's important that I have a big shot that captures all of it. Or you have the liberty to say, hmm, that description really highlighted like this one cool moment, like the fact that one character is wearing a belt buckle with an eagle on it, holding a snake in its talons, right? So you might say like, that was a really cool detail that that description included. I, as the camera person, think it would look really great if we start with a close up on that and then pull back to reveal the rest of the scene. Because that carried a lot of weight for you reading the passage. It's much more liberating for you guys when you write to let your camera people make those decisions. Let your camera people think, like, what'll look really cool? What emotion am I trying to convey with this scene, right? So that's why um, it'll be, we're gonna encourage you to try to start using a format like this. Because what this does is then when you get together to film, everybody already has this idea, this very strong idea of what the scene can look like and what's going to happen at filming and everybody gets to generate that idea based on their personal role, rather than having one individual have to go through particulate and sort of break it apart or having these conflicting ideas. Everybody has developed their role in completion. Does that make sense? Do you see how script enables that to happen? Yeah. Have you guys ever tried to write like a formal screenwrite screenplay before? <laughs> ever tried to use this? Yeah? Was it enjoyable? Did you have fun with it? It's more of an assessment, so not really. Okay, fair enough. So this will not be for uh, a traditional assessment in that regard, right? So you can do more with your description. This description that I've written here as an example is literally just telling you what the function of this space is. It's not actually like a fun description. So um, 
what are some of the sketch ideas that you've come up with? What, what's one idea that you've got right now? Um, well, I guess we had a meeting, so we were talking about it, like pumpkin carving contests and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was just stuff like that. Okay, so can you guys take a minute and try to maybe write, like, what might the scene look like at the beginning of an Apex Friendship High School pumpkin carving contest? Like, let's say you have two characters in the scene. What are they doing? What's going on around them? What might you write for this description section of your script? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, a pumpkin carving contest at Apex Venture High School. to a group of people. Yeah. pause on that and what what kind of details did you include in your descriptions what kind of stuff did you point out yeah tension tension how do you mean um, if we have two characters and let's say they're competing to who has the best jack-o-lantern if you have that tension and you have that dark on the steel then that's what so how did you convey that in the description that you wrote um, the scene is spooky. The lights are lowered to convey the jack-o'-lanterns. The viewers will notice a serious tension among the two characters. They are competing for the best looking lanterns. Yeah, and so um, that's great because that's telling you some strong character information. Um, where are your characters sitting? Um, I'm feeling a table to each side. Jack-o'-lanterns look at each other. Okay. Oh, so that's an important detail. So let's say you have that. You then say, like, Jack and Timothy are sitting behind a table. Their jack-o'-lanterns are staring one another down. There is palpable tension between the two. And that's basically what Juan wrote, but what it does is it re-emphasizes a broad strokes vision of this space and the characters in it, with, while not sort of emphasizing the relation of the camera to that scene. You want to de-emphasize the relation of the camera to your scene so your camera people can take control. Uh, but emphasize the emotions and the content that you want them to get. Raiden, would you mind sharing the one that you wrote? I can read it, you can read it, but yeah. I said, mine's not as spooky. It's like, it would probably be like midday and either in front of the school or behind it in that little grassy area. 
Having heard that, do you can you guys see in your head like what what the scene as a whole might look like? And so, do you have a way that you might want to film that? Like that sort of pops into mind. You could do a Yeah. So from that description, she was able to get two awesome options. One being a pan which would achieve showing your audience like the whole row and the changing emotions. Or you could do multiple short shots that would have cuts in between them of like one person who looks super vibrant, looks super vibrant. Okay, that's, that's close oh, enough. I thought you were just saying repeating it. No, like, okay. no, there, that was good. And then one person who looks really nervous. Good, good. And then a couple people who look terribly disinterested. Perfect, see? And so both of those give you like a vision, but they're two unique approaches from the cinema standpoint. Do you think both would still convey the description that you had written? Both would still capture that whole scene, right? And so by writing your descriptions in this way, you're giving your, your camera people liberty to do something cool with it, to create something new, while respecting what you put on the page for your script. That won't get lost, but it opens up more doors for creativity in the camera world. Um, and it opens up those doors for you, your actors to kind of decide, like, ooh, I really think I'll knock it out of the park as a disinterested pumpkin carver because I hate Halloween. Or somebody who, like, thinks will really knock it out of the park as a super hype pumpkin carver because they love Halloween, right? So I'm going to leave the rest of these script examples clipped to okay. the other teammates. Yep. Uh, do, do you guys have questions about like how this formatting works. There are parts of it that we didn't talk about in detail, so I want to know if any of those caught your eye or are curious to you. No? There are some ways that it does give you the liberty to tell the editors or the camera people important ways that things happen. What does the VO next to Jenna's name mean? Voiceover. Which, which means that Jenna can't be physically in this scene, or if she is, what is your audience going to assume that voiceover means? If Jenna is being filmed, but her mouth isn't moving, but we hear her voice. Yeah, they're going to assume that it's narration coming from where? Her thoughts. Her thoughts. We're going to assume we're getting the voice inside of her head. So you can give your actors and cinematographer, director of photography some sort of guidance in that regard, saying like, okay, this is a voiceover. To be, be knowledgeable about that, it either means this is supposed to be her thought, or this is supposed to be maybe her off screen is OS. So like, I am currently off screen for what this camera will be filming. My voice will just radiate out of nowhere like some ethereal being or somebody standing in the room next door. Right? So you can take the liberty of, of pushing different, different positionings of characters onto your, onto your DPs and actors. It doesn't happen in description. Does that make sense? How much time do we have on? Five minutes. Four minutes okay. now. I want to show you guys cool stuff now, okay? Can we watch cool editing stuff? Yeah. So, that's not what I want to talk about. This is what I want to talk about. Editing is like all that process that none of you guys are on the editing team, but this is what the editors will be doing to take the footage that you acted in and you wrote and you filmed to make it something that links together cohesively. Um, and you might indicate where it says cut to in your script, you might indicate, say, match cut. And what a match cut does is it's editing two scenes together so that an action or image links them. So let's say you have two people who are about to fight, right? And one of them takes a big swing, and right as the fist connects with the jaw, 
of the other person, the scene cuts, and to like somebody knocking on a door. And it's a match cut because it follows that motion and plays on what your audience anticipates will come next. So you might indicate that during the pumpkin carving contest, you want to have somebody like stab into a pumpkin and then cut on that knife to somebody stabbing into something else. Please don't make it violent because like this is a production for <laughs> school television, but maybe cutting into a pepper to make like chili. Yeah. I see that in a lot of old movies, like mm -hmm. um, whole section like that. They have like, they'll have one scene and they'll have to play a different scene. They'll have to wait for it to connect. Yeah, yeah. Quentin Tarantino loves to do this kind of stuff, so Pulp Fiction is a great example. Um, there's another really famous one from the movie Psycho, which you may or may not have seen because it is a scary, scary movie. But it is a match between somebody's eye and the drain of a shower. Um, and so they have similar shapes, so the camera leads you from one to the other. That transition is smooth. Um, and so that's the function of a match cut. And it can be very symbolic. Like, um, this is an example from The Importance of Being Earnest, which is a play that you will probably read while you are in school because it is a masterpiece. What do you notice about the cut from this woman shooting an arrow to this scene of two men in a bar? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you follow the line of where the arrow would be, the man is doing this, like, oh, my heart hurts. What might that tell you about the relationship between these two characters? What? Okay, yeah, it isn't very good. And what else might it imply? That she's going to kill him, potentially. What do we associate arrows with besides killing people? What small chubby deity do we associate arrows with? Cupid, right? Cupid. Uh, so. It also, and so in this case, it does indicate that they don't get along, and she does not like him, and they are antagonistic towards one another. But this is a romance, so over the course of time, that antagonism gives way to affection. So this match cut shows you both at once. Okay, go one minute. Okay, and so then these are other types of uh, cuts that you guys could indicate. A smash cut jars your audience. So you guys may want to try to use this in your scripts for this spooky, scary Halloween special. Because what it does is it takes something that you think is going to be one thing and it smashes away to something else. And one of the most common examples is like, it happens a lot in the Scream movies. Somebody's about to get killed and then it cuts to like a bunch of teens at a party. Or like uh, a small child's birthday party. Or a museum where it's totally silent. You know, something entirely unexpected. And then finally, have you guys seen Inception? Yes. Yes? Yes? An eyeline match is a very important kind of thing, particularly for the cinematographers amongst you to understand. So Leo DiCaprio here is looking up, and when the camera cuts, it is shooting at an angle that indicates what he would be looking at. In this case, his two children. If Leo's eyes are like looking up to the corner, and then our next shot shows us those children at the same angle, what happens to the audience's understanding of the scene? He's not looking at what we want him to be looking at. Yeah. Thank you guys. Good job.